Uh, professor Barton is a professor of history at the University of San Diego. His research concerns the relationship between different ethno-religious communities within Iberia and the Western Mediterranean, including North Africa, during the medieval period. As an associate of the CMR Center for Early Global Studies, he has coordinated and organized uh, quite a number of workshops and conferences here at UCLA. And in the meantime, I should also add uh, that he has recently won the Medieval Academy of America's 2023 Jerome E. Singerman Prize for his monograph, Victory Shadow, Conquest and Governance in Medieval Catalonia, published with Cornell University Press in 2019. And with that, I invite uh, Professor Barton. Great, well, we're finally here. <laughs> Um, really gives me tremendous joy and satisfaction to be able to join uh, Trinka and Sishan uh, um, in welcoming you to the CMRS Center uh, for Early Global Studies and these exciting two days we have in store um, as we explore the Western Mediterranean and the global Middle Ages. Now, I know that many of you have traveled long distances to take part in these proceedings, and I would like to express my sincere gratitude at your willingness to invest the time and energy collaborate with us and make this exploration a reality. This symposium has been well over a year in the making. And over the course of that long journey, I've incurred many debts to people and organizations that I'd like to just take a minute or two to, to recognize. And I promise that I won't talk long enough about the music to start uh, <laughs> and get me off the stage. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Zrinka Stolziak um, for her visionary leadership of CMRS SEGS and for enthusiastic support of this initiative in particular. As I hope the symposium's descriptive materials and publicity have made clear, the idea of putting together a conference to explore the global Middle Ages was inspired by the reimagining of CMRS. She has overseen during, during her incredibly active and fruitful directorship over the past several years. TUN and uh, Karen Burgess at CMRS SEGS provided sage advice and invaluable and tireless support throughout the entire planning process. And Santera Palmer stepped in after Brett Landenberger's retirement to assist with the technology and really was very helpful as well. Uh, I'd also like to honor Teo Reese, who as always has been a hugely influential and helpful uh, source, a resource behind the scenes. And I regret that other commitments ha uh, have taken him away from Los Angeles so that he can't be here today to add his rich perspectives and gravitas to the proceedings or enjoy the fruits of our joint labors. One of our ambitions was to make this symposium more diverse and inclusive, which is in keeping with the, this general spirit of globalism we are here to explore by issuing a, a call to presenters rather than simply inviting speakers as has been our customary practice in past events. While this process made for more planning work, I couldn't be happier with the results. The program is so much richer because it now consists of a more diverse assortment of emerging mid-career and senior scholars, many of whom uh, were outside of our usual network of collaborators. I'm thrilled about the new ideas and perspectives you are bringing to these proceedings and anticipate that the next two days will provide many opportunities to forge new relationships and networks that we'll be able to benefit from in the future. I would also like to thank my dear colleague, Maya Swaffer Irish, former president of uh, the American Academy of Research Historians of Medieval Spain, which I'll refer to uh, in, uh, from now on as ARMS, uh, just to make things easier, uh, shorten my talk a little bit, uh, for helping uh, make the paper selections and serving as a valuable resource during the initial planning stages, bringing people to LA uh, from as far as away as Portugal and Spain and hosting them isn't cheap, especially as inflation drives up the cost of everything. And it wouldn't have been possible without generous support from a long list of sponsors that we've already uh, put on the on the conference webpage and published new materials, but I'd just like to briefly recognize them now. Apart from the indispensable seed money provided by CMRS SEGS, um, Ke Kevin Terraciano and the history department were extraordinarily generous, really couldn't have done this without their them stepping up. Um, I would also like to thank UC, uh, UC Humanities Research Institute, the Interim Dean of Social Sciences, uh, Abel Valenzuela, Dean of Humanities, uh, Alex uh, Alexandra Mina Stern, Ali Badad, and the uh, Center for Near Eastern Studies, and uh, Asma Saeed and the Islamic Studies Program. I offer my heartfelt gratitude to all of these extraordinary sponsors for making our ambition to put together this landmark collaboration between Simaris Segs and ARMS a reality. 
So this symposium is the culminating event in ARMS' first ever attempt to structure a sequence of programming over the course of many months that contributes to the exploration of a shared theme, Iberian history as global history. This unifying concept seemed like an obvious choice for me and the ARMS board when we first discussed the possibility well over a year ago, given the considerable excitement uh, that has accompanied the rise of the global Middle Ages paradigm over the past uh, two decades or so. This interest has only grown with the mounting sense of urgency to make the field of medieval studies more diverse and inclusive uh, in response to racist aspects of his past and also to recent abuse by certain alt-right to nativist political groups. At various venues over the past year from Leeds to Kalamazoo, ARMS members and audiences have explored many aspects of the global middle ages along both research and pedagogical lines. Most of these interventions have addressed aspects of the global middle ages through cognate channels, such as interconnectivity, internationalism, without addressing the concept uh, and the question of its usefulness head on. And I think it's not too late to spend a few minutes doing that now. Geraldine Heng, who, who helped develop the term the global middle ages in the early 2000s, doesn't precisely define what she means by global, but nevertheless has forcefully argued that such, quote, a global perspective of the deep past can transform our understanding of history and of time itself, enabling us to identify, for instance, not just a single scientific and industrial revolution uh, that occurred once exclusively in the West, but the recurrence of multiple scientific and industrial revolutions in the non-Western, non-modern world, end quote. But what does it mean to adopt a global perspective for a world that was pre-global, to revisit something that Drinko was just talking about? Is the idea to engage in a comparative pre-modern uh, kind of area studies between parallel and potentially disconnected regions and societies, or are we instead trying to inject world historical methodologies into medieval studies in order to trace broader connections and influences? Even if we extend beyond the traditional reach of the Middle Ages, into the age of European empire building in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. Is an early modern or modern sense of globalism helpful for teaching and research on the pre-global Middle Ages, or is it simply an anachronism that serves to distort these subjects? Indeed, criticism of the global Middle Ages is considerable and falls along precisely these lines, that the concept eludes a definition, that it's anachronistic, and that it constitutes a self-serving attempt by predominantly white Eurocentric field to colonize the scholars, scholarship, and historical actors of assorted peripheral areas in hopes of recasting themselves as more multicultural and inclusive while assuaging their guilt about their field's dark past. One recent critique, for example, has argued that the global middle ages concept, like, like other theoretical fads, what they call fads, is, um, is simply another instance of medievalist, quote, borrowing anachronistic models and frameworks for historical explanation in an attempt to increase the discipline's relevance to outsiders. Global history and other new paradigms are based on modern events and patterns of development. These theoretical models constructed on modern evidence do not easily fit pre-modern history and thus lead us astray, end quote. Rather than simply doubling down on traditional methodologies and frameworks because they seem to fit pre-modern history, this symposium seeks to evaluate the costs um, and benefits of conceptualizing history within this more expansive paradigm. What new questions or comparisons does the global Middle Ages uh, approach inspire beyond what we can collectively achieve via more traditional approaches? And does this utility override the down, downsides? Just as post-colonial theory, queer theory, and other seemingly anachronistic approaches have been controversial, but arguably, ultimately, in, uh, they've enriched medieval studies in myriad ways, I would suggest that the global knowledge concept can be useful to think with. Thinking in global terms about relationships, identities, and patterns has the potential to open our eyes to blind spots and ingrained assumptions that will persist if we refuse to diversify our perspectives and tools by cross-pollinating with other time periods, regions, and disciplines, even ones that might not have been in frequent or even direct contact with the areas we are studying. Global methodologies, in other words, can, but don't always have to be expressed spatially. 
but instead can embody an openness to relationships and ways of thinking that might otherwise escape our notice. Now, I believe this is the very approach that David Nirenberg was attempting to outline when he delivered a brilliant plenary lecture at this very podium at the Mediterranean Conference uh, I co-organized in October 2018 with Zrinka, uh, Marie Kelleher, who's here today, and Antonio Zaldivar, uh, who will be joining us tomorrow, just months before Zrinka started her first directorship term, and well before she had begun her campaign, or maybe not before she'd begun it, but before she achieved it, to transform the Center of Medieval Renaissance Studies into CMRS SEGS. In those remarks, which maybe some of you remember, uh, David dab dazzled the audience with his uh, erudition by juxtaposing what he described as, quote, crude sketches of widely dispersed episodes, ranging from early Christianity and Islam to 18th century North Africa, in which mass conversion has stimulated thinking about genealogy, lineage, and the biological reproduction of aspects of culture that we today call religion, end quote. He, uses the, he used these targeted comparisons to make the case that we all needed to work harder to become what he termed non-provincial historians. Provincialism, he conceded in that quote here, is not a crime. And I love how he puts this. He's, it is rather an original sin. One the historian is born with, since our perspective is always limited, relative to our vantage point, in particular to our person, abilities, interests, and knowledge. I found these insights to be deeply thought-provoking, and they prompted me to engage in considerable soul-searching about my scholarly identity and the goals of my research over the past several years. My sense is that Zrinka and the CMRS SEGS board are engaging in their own soul-searching and institutional battle against provincialism by adopting this new mission for the center and seeking to organize the work of faculty, students, uh, and visitors around these research axes that we referenced in this explanatory statement for the symposium. And they're also available on the website. Um, conversion mobility, sustainability repurposing, fluidity permanence, um, bodies performance, and communication archive. These expansive modes of approaching early history uh, and, uh, and culture have been, have been carefully calculated to inspire non-provincialist thinking, engagement, scholarship, and teaching. They encourage a wider and more varied community of scholars to venture away from their formerly siloized, regionalized areas of study and ingrained traditional frameworks in search of new connections that will encourage a sorts of comparative work envisioned by David Nuremberg that has such great potential to enrich our historical understanding. Now in surveying the titles and abstracts submitted by our diversity of panelists for the next uh, two days, I believe that many, if not most of us, feel similarly sanguine about the potential uh, constructiveness of exploring medieval and early modern history and culture and studies in the spirit, even if we don't all conceptualize or adopt the global and ages in, in the same way. Based on the abstracts they've submitted, our presenters clearly have answered our call by considering in a wide range of indirect and, uh, and direct modes how this paradigm might inspire new inroads for exploring the interrelationship of variegated societies and cultures within Mediterranean and extra Mediterranean contexts. The work and ideas we will be confronting over the next two days implicitly challenge the pernicious binaries of European, non-European, medieval, early modern, pre-modern, modern. And, and in this way, advance the critique once voiced by the theorist Bruno Latour, who urged scholars to, quote, recognize the multiple layers of interrelations and intercausality, the manifold processes, movements, and passages that shape and transform our world, end quote. I see enormous potential in the ability of the global approach to help us attempt this shift in perspective advocated by Latour, moving from what he calls, uh, and I quote here, uh, a static metaphysics devoted to hypothesizing stable essences to what he termed, and I quote again, uh, infra-physics, by which we can recognize a realm of mediation and possibility without a contrary or binary opposite, end quote. 
Many of us who work on media, uh, Mediterranean history have long worked to further similar goals without consciously referencing the global middle ages. We've often felt the call to renegotiate the medieval early modern divide, which often stands in the way of recognizing patent continuities across these centuries. And to contend with nationalistic or Eurocentric theological narratives that threaten to erect artificial geographical barriers of psychological barriers, intellectual barriers between Christian and non-Christian populations. One only has to look to the work of our two keynote speakers for vivid examples of the embodiment of this global medieval approach eroding at these binaries. And I just, I'm not stealing away from the chairs, but I just thought I'd talk a little bit about why we chose these speakers and are so grateful to have them here with us. So by founding the Spain North Africa project over a decade ago, Toby Liang has been one of the most influential voices in the academy to promote the exploration of the Western Mediterranean as a unified region by binding together Iberia and the Maghreb through interdisciplinary approaches and intercultural and interinstitutional cooperation. And our second plenary speaker, Samantha Kelly, established her expertise in late medieval dynastic and religious history in Southern Italy, and could have easily continued to write books and articles along that comfortable established line of research as many scholars do. Instead, with the help of a Mellon New Directions grant, she, which I was too old once I found out about it, which is a very sad about this, uh, she learned an entirely new research language and historiography in order to develop a new project on the presence of Ethiopian pilgrims in Rome as a lens through which to examine mounting later medieval and early modern global interactions. So Toby and Samantha's inspirational leadership of this fragmented movement to explore non-traditional paradigms and frameworks for the study of early Mediterranean history makes them obvious choices for serving as our plenary speakers. And I'm so grateful to them for agreeing to travel so far to share their experiences and enrich these conversations over the next two days. As the symposium brings to a close this fruitful experimental arms series on Iberian history as global history, it is simultaneously kicking off and setting the tone for another year of busy programming on early global studies at the center. I feel honored to have been entrusted with this opportunity and all of the responsibilities that come with it. And would like to thank all of the other presenters who have come from near and far to, uh, to contribute to this important conversation by sharing their research, and, and insights about the medieval and early modern Mediterranean and beyond. And I should also extend a huge thank you to the chairs for generously carving out time from your busy schedules to help moderate these proceedings and enrich these discussions with your involvement. Thank you, everyone. And so just to conclude, in his story, Pascal's Sphere, Jorge Luis Borges once asserted that, quote, universal history is the history of a few metaphors. And I'm sure many of you have heard this quote, which I also ruminate over frequently in my life, um, more than I think about Rome. Uh, you caught that TikTok thing. Okay, um, experimenting with global approaches has the potential to help us identify and examine these universalizing metaphors and follow Bruno Latour's wise counsel by pluralizing illusory binaries in history. It's worth seeking to resist the illusion of stable and fixed nature and culture, and instead recognize that our historical subjects lived in the midst of mobile and plural natures and cultures that were themselves the relative products of history. I'm very much looking forward to learning from and with all of you over the next two days, and I'm confident that our shared discussions will help us further this joint quest to deprovincialize further our historical imaginations. Thank you very much.